Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Hey guys, let's go, let's do it. Easy content. Let's. I'm gonna react to a sword expert reacting to movies. Nice. If you're new, hello, my name is Connor. I am from Rhode Island, best state in the union. New England, better England, USA in that order. And I like to watch stuff. How you doing, neighbor? Love to have you. Let's go. If you're not ready to learn, there's the door. I'll make this down the hall. You're in the wrong class. Make me... Pizza. Oh, it's pizza. Mozzarella sticks. Let's go. Original link to the video, top of the description, right below that link to the Discord. Let's go. Oh, Sean Bean, you're, he's goodness, gonna die. This is terrible. There is so much bad in this. Hi there, my name's David Rowling for the London Long Killer Sword Academy. Mustache. I'm a full-time swordsmanship instructor, and today I'm gonna have a look at a load of clips about sword fighting and slag them off hideously. Do it. Beautiful man. So basically what I have with me here is a long sword. Long sword for me is generally a sword which is held in two hands. So it doesn't matter whether the grip is short or long, it doesn't really matter. You have a pommel, a cross guard, a grip, a blade. Usually within fencing we divide that into two halves but different authors divide it into different, um, um, different divisions. So we'll have a strong half which is the half from the middle. to. So you can have like, you can have a very long sword but it have a small handle that you, and it's still a short sword. Okay. The hilt, and then from the middle down to the point is the weakest part. And we're just really looking at geometry and leverage. That you get this big thing in historical European martial arts, as I do, where you're not allowed to carry swords on your shoulder because that's really, really frowned upon and no one would ever do it. Except there's actually critique in manual saying that you shouldn't do it, which implies that people do do it. So carrying the sword in your hand is a very, very good thing. And you see this a lot, people holding the sword on their shoulder and just walking around with it without a scabbard on necessarily, so it's ready to use. Imagine people in the EU doesn't have the as much guns, but just like walking around like with a pistol just like with your hand on on just like with your hand on the gun just like the entire time like it's the wild west that was pretty I have cool issues with this particular fight because there's a lot of reverse grip with the sword being held backwards down here it's not a good way for you to use the sword you sacrifice your ability to fend above very very clearly you have not got any reach it's not safe but he's changed grip. Yay. Oh, and he's back. I like how he moves. I, I think this? he's got a good organic feel to him. Yeah. Generally, the sword is being moved in front of him, which is a very, very good thing. It's very rarely just kept behind him. So he's closing the space off between him and his opponent with the sword. One of the things I like about some of the Witcher's fight scenes is that there's this idea of moving between the opponents. And you see this in things like Godino, where the idea of spinning, something which people really, really quite often frown upon within the HEMA community, is very much used because you're trying to keep opponents away from each other. So it's not just about fighting you and concentrating and moving into you, it's against driving you back and then hitting I feel like especially if you're a big guy, a bigger guy who, who's not as agile, I feel like you're going to have to use spinning of your body really towards your uh, advantage if you're a much smaller more athletic guy maybe you can the next person the next person the next person so these spinning moves actually become quite important and this angled sinister straight into you idea goes out the window it's not this focus suddenly it's much more wide and it's a flurry the thing Ooh. is most of my judgment on this fight, fight scene is actually henry cavill being very very good physically and yeah, wait, what sorry. Is actually much more wide. Did he use like magic and it's right a there? Flurry. The thing is, is, most of my judgment on this fight, fight scene is actually Henry Cavill being very, very good physically. And what is shown in this fight scene being probably the most disappointing fight scene in The Witcher. So for Henry Cavill, it's going to have like an eight. For actual quality of fighting, it's going to have about four. <laughs> Commodus. 
So there's bits in there that actually aren't too bad looking at it. There's evasions of the blade um, from the Emperor, which could be accidental, but you have these movements of just moving around as the, as the parry's coming in. That's actually not too bad. You see this kind of thing quite often. You see it in Destrezza when uh, opponents are moving around each other, where a parry comes in, you disengage underneath as it's happening. So you have potential for some actually quite interesting movements in there. Good parry. That in Talhofer, usually accompanied by a wrap because of the closure of the close distance. Kicking up the heels is referred to in quite a few treaties, quite often accompanied by a movement onto the jaw as well. So potentially within this fight scene, I'd say in those last two actions from the cover to the, uh, to the kick with the legs and the sweeping up of the heels, I'd say those are actually quite good actions. Usually you'd see more control of the opponent's weapon arm or their balance with the offhand as well, but that part's actually reasonably good. So for that, I'm actually going to give it a six because I think those two aspects save it slightly. Okay, so again, we've got some very, very good bits on this. The first bit of this is the the shunting away of the opponent. I really, really like this. He creates distance between the two opponents. Now, you could argue that maybe he'd want to push the opponents into each other, but he, he has a very, very good instinctive response. Push one away, get the weapon from it, and then on to the other one. And then a good, clean finish on one of the cuts. Nothing posh, just a simple cut of wrath, in effect. Pretty good. I'd give that a seven. I think that's quite a comfortable thing. Again, I think it's very easy within uh, judging this from a human's perspective to get very focused on an individual. And this is showing good awareness of space, maintaining that distance, and then simple finishes, nothing posh. Japanese soldiers terrify me. So immediately the first attack is this big, sp I'll spin at you, I'll expose my back and the distance is so bad that he could just be stabbed in the back. What's this guy's name? This is the James Bond I grew up with. Oh, what's his name? I forget. Yeah, it's, it's a broadsword or, or a sabre or something. Therefore, you have to go and cut candles or scenery. You don't use this like this. This is terrible. Quite often in Japanese swordsmanship, you're moving the glass. I can't stop the... trying to think about his name. I, I'm not going to be able to, to pay attention. Uh, James Bond. It's Pierce Brosnan. I just th I just thought of it. but That's his name. It's Pierce Brosnan. I, I thought of it while I was typing in James Bond. Okay. It's the slag deposits effectively silicon. In Japanese Sorry. swordsmanship, you're moving the glass deposits, the slag deposits effectively silicon deposits that can be in steel. You're moving those throughout the entirety of the length of the blade. And through those foldings, you basically you spread that out. So you make sure that your blade hasn't got one particular area of weakness. Now, with European swords, before we had that consistency, we did something very similar, except that we twisted them like string. So that if one thread was weak, then that could be a problem in itself. But you're having multiple threads and twisting them around each other, you create right. something stronger. That said, swords do snap, swords do bend. And there's always a fine point. And you can't guarantee the process is not perfect. Even nowadays, with much more clear definitions of how steel should be made and produced, blades still break. So it's not impossible for this to happen. So this is where it really gets quite terrible. There's this insane idea that somehow long swords are really heavy clumsy weapons they are not you can move a long sword much more quickly and much more dexterously than you can a rapier it's still balanced as if to be used in one hand but you have the advantage of being able to move it around this position the position of the forward hand now even more than a rapier though which you can literally do with 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 like your wrist just i mean he's the expert the most barbaric moment of a longsword, the barbaric technique. We have a technique called the Strike of Wrath, which is a strike that uses the entirety of the anterior oblique sling. So it's the most powerful strike you can do. But it's not done foolishly. It's done as a mechanic. It's a way of claiming space in front of you, claiming that space for yourself, killing with it if you can, and then going on to pursue your opponent through that. Wide swings don't serve anybody, and they represent the actual piece of equipment very, very poorly. Doing a spin when you're not engaged with the opponent's blade is insane because you don't know what their sword is doing. And because you're so close and you don't know where their sword is, obviously they can cut you freely because they're still facing at you, they still have all of their requisite safety in their hands. 
three, four out of ten. This, in case you didn't know, is the best fight scene ever in any film ever. The fencing in it is completely irrelevant. The fencing is part of a narrative device. It's not meant to overwhelm you. It's just there happening while the dialogue does. You're using Bonetti's defense against me, huh? Eh? I thought it fitting, considering the rocky terrain. There's references to Bonetti's defense. I don't even really know what that is. But references to Tebow, and Tebow's one of my favorite systems. But they're not showing any awareness of Tebow. Uh, Tebow operates on the idea of the perfect angle that you see in a lot of Spanish swordsmanship and Destreza particularly here where you have a 90 degree angle which is maintained as much as possible and you don't make lateral movements with your arms but all of this is what we call vulgar angles where the point is higher than the hilt and lots of lateral movement. Naturally you must expect me to attack with Capafero. Naturally but I find that Tibble cancels out Capafero. Rapier, some people will call it a side sword. The divisions are really a later thing. We don't worry about Small it too much. It's a sword that you hold in one hand. Now, again, we have the quillens. Quite often, or which is like the cross guard in effect, quite often people would hold this simply like so without their finger over the bars. And these extra rings would be to stop things from landing on your fingers when you're holding the sword normally. And this allows you to put your thumb on there. Later on, you start seeing people- Yeah, holding... exactly. I, I, I was, I was gonna say, I, I feel like I'd put my finger through that little slide there, but. That makes it very open to if they swing right in here, there goes that finger. A sword like so, okay? But it's not universal. Sometimes it is just used like this, okay? Sometimes these are very, very ornate, as you can see here. There's a lot of wire around here. And then sometimes it's just a simple cup. There's something I want to tell you. Tell me. I'm not left-handed either. The idea of being able to fence with both hands shouldn't be necessarily a problem. Um, fighting somebody who is differently handed to you as well shouldn't be an uncommon experience. So this, this kind of thing, although it's amusing, you don't want to do this sort of thing at close distance because obviously while you're busy changing your sword hand, your opponent can stab you and this kind of thing. Here you have a bit where as the blade comes through it disengages so you're having the blade changing from one side to the other and in order to fight that what you're doing is rather than doing lateral. I wonder if a left-handed person had a slight advantage over a right-handed person just because the vast majority of people what is it like nine out of ten people are right-handed or something like that and so they are going to encounter a lot of right-handed people where voice crack whereas not a lot of people will often encounter a left-handed swordsman and so they might have an upper hand on you i, I would guess power is like this, I don't know. you're wrapping the blade and you're staying engaged to it, and that can be used to throw the opponent's sword out of their hand, so there's, there's a degree of reality in that, it's good. Technically wise, I'd still give it sort of like a 6-7, even with its parody fencing, it still has better fencing than um, than a lot of the others. Nostalgia school. I'm just not a Game of Thrones guy. I love Sean Bean though. That's quite nice because in effect you have a very, very um, nasty version of a movement of conclusion. And this is basically where in using a sword to parry here, we then do something with the offhand. If we were doing Verdadera, the idea would be to restrain the opponent's weapon hand so that we can control it and we can choose whether they live or die and we can show mercy at this point. If you're doing this, this is lovely. He doesn't have to worry about the guy's offhand so much because the guy has both hands on the sword. There's a closure off of the line and the guy giving him the distance because he doesn't have to move his feet the guy's going to come and hit him anyway he gets to push it aside he gets to thrust through he's got control of the opponent's sword still and he gets to finish him so that i actually quite like that's pretty good i was trying to think I'm of not an eye no i'm entirely never. sure holding your hand palm down with a long sword is a good way not to get the sword taken oh my goodness this is terrible there is so much bad in this Again, we're back on this idea that if you've got a long sword, you have to do this with it, and it has to be wide and spinny, and it has to be these big moves. It's meant to be dexterous. You have this idea that there's basically half an L, the idea of being this kind of space here, rather halfway between here and here. You don't want to be more than this way, far away from your opponent with the point at all times. So if they drive you away, you're trying to find a way to get your point onto them. Most long sword is intrinsically trying to dominate a space very very close into the core of your opponent if they move you sufficiently around you're immediately back at another opening if they stay tight on the blade and the angles tight just enough to parry like so you'll try and drive the blade in guys i feel like i would always have like a little bag of sand on me so that or really finely fine powder or something sand is going to go and so 
and and just throw it in someone's face. I feel like that would be so effective. Because like throw and thrust because they're going to be like this no like no matter what, they're not going to be like this and just take it and so you're going to have this little moment some kind of maybe like flowers something and still maintaining contact on that. All this wide around movement is complete nonsense. <laughs> Okay, knocking the blade down and striking back up. Now, you could argue that this is almost a, a nodding in effect. The idea of beating someone's blade down and then hit, hitting back up with the false edge. Here you see where the sword is sweeping wide and one person is standing with their point right in front of the other. You don't parry, then come back here. You stand here and you stab them immediately because the blade has moved out of presence. Well, that was good. Yep. If someone has got their back Sean to you... Bean, if he survived, I would have been shocked. Um... Also, I, I would wonder, some kind of leather glove or, or kind of leather glove with kind of maybe plated fingers, just to kind of, in some cases where, obviously a sword is very sharp and I'm not sure how feasible it is, but grabbing a sword would be so beneficial if you could do it without your hand being ripped off by them sliding the, the sword out, but, or, or just something to kind of block it and because you can only deflect it so in like two directions if you catch it with your sword. But if you can get some kind of special glove to kind of parry the blade with your sword maybe. So that you don't have to get a direct hit with your glove hand. But kind of parry the sword and then with your protected glove hand grab the sword. And then take out a dagger or something and, and stab them. If you have a spear, do stab them in the back of the leg. That, again, redeeming feature, that's, that's given it another point. So I quite like the fight scene between Brienne of Tarth I actually and think Arya. I've seen I think this. that's quite good. It's cohesive. It has that real focus to it. So the movement is constant. Standard. Neither of them is really sacrificing. There's no great pauses. There's always, I want to be back in the fight. I Horse versus agility. See what I meant? Oh, like, right here, perfect example. Like, she's someone who would have to, um, like, I feel like a spinning move would be a much more important thing than for someone like this little girl here especially with a little rapier sword and she's very agile wouldn't have to really spin as much there's no great pauses there's always i want to be back in the fight i want to be back in it i do like in general the hound fights because they are just like meh, dead that's good and i think having that idea that a blade is intrinsically there to either stab someone or hit them with it and remove all the sort of like fussy detail is a very good thing to have in how the series. Can... He didn't, but how could, those slashing moves can really cut through armor like that? I feel like you're, if you're going to face anyone with armor, you're going to have to stab them to kill them because I feel like any slashing, I, I, he's the, I don't know. All the sort of like fussy detail is a very good thing to have in the series. Classic. I love this movie, even though it is, uh... I'm not s saying it's the most amazing movie, I just, it's a classic. First, the twirling is dreadful, but the, the, the blades are all over the place. There's no safety in them. And now we're being focused on a single opponent, we could use the sword in a much more efficient way. Even if I were to twirl the swords towards you, you'd always want one blade in presence, always one blade doing something, never having the swords over here. Pretty much is. How are your hands not... At that not... point, I think the idea of restraining the two weapon hands becomes more important than actually taking the weapons out of the hand. So at that point, I would suggest that potentially you're looking at a way of either throwing the opponent as far from you as possible, throwing them down the really big hole on the other side of you might be a good thing. So you multi that one? Uh... 10. Oh. Yep, she's dead now. Yeah, you're, you're really looking at just absolute theater here. And that's that's fine. It is. What it, it, is. it really uh, is. Like, it's... you don't you don't want to stop and look in a movie like this at, like, all these guys waiting around and kind of slashing air and then, like, going in on their turn. It's terrible, terrible sword fighting. This idea of driving people apart to fight. So you don't want to be standing still. You don't want people to be managing the space while your space is getting more and more cramped. 
one of the things that uh, is misunderstood quite often is that in pattern welded blades quite often these were given mirror polishes and I believe unless this is anecdotal um, that there's reference to people blowing on the blades so that the the breath actually brings out the pattern weld for a moment so you can see it so yeah blades historically are incredibly highly polished in various different places um, certainly in Japanese swords that's the thing certainly European swords it's a thing <laughs> interesting tactical decisions here so you have a point where somebody has control of the blade and if you think like the parrying daggers you have, re have really options to take the blade of the opponent on your dagger or to take them right the right he's to he stops somebody has control right there of the blade. and then she just stays there with the sword if you think like the parrying daggers you have re have really options to take the blade of the opponent on your dagger or to take them on your sword and to attack them with the other but in order to do so you'd want to maintain that contact so to do an action like this with the opponent's blade still directly in the middle doesn't make any sense really so you had a point of control or a point of control both of those have been sacrificed it's amazing that one of these people didn't die in the process of this. There should have either been disemboweling or a stab or whichever, or the other person should have ploughed straight through the middle in the space. For, from the point of view point of a good cohesive fight scene that involves realistic technique, I'm gonna give that a two. Oh, the classic intentional miss. <laughs> classic intentional miss. <laughs> right. Right here, right here. So this guy, with his back to the screen, the intentional miss. He's swinging for her, and he's like, oh, I'm actually going to hit her. Go over the top. <laughs> okay, the first miracle of this fight is that they don't manage to kill each other. Um, there, there are forms which consist about fighting around somebody. Um, usually that other person is disabled so that they're kind of in a position where you don't have to worry about them. They'll be prone or something like this, or perhaps you'll be bodyguarding someone, so it's a, a way of moving around each other. I would not really like to have my back to someone who was swinging something sharp or burny. <laughs> So much of this is almost a method to show how he feels. So you have an expression of emotion going on in the fight scenes rather than necessarily being this very, very tight, cohesive fight. His anger is always explicit. Everything is these wide, powerful slashes that aren't necessarily good for defense. <laughs> It's so heavily stylized. I think in things like the um, Revenge of the Sith, you have these very, very dynamic fight scenes between Obi Wan and Anakin, and Underrated those, movie. I think, are much more expressive at combat. Even if the distance is a little bit funny, even if they're standing toe to toe and waving the swords around, there's a lot more aggression and interaction in that. As such, I think I'd give it a five out of ten. As, as in, it has aspects that I really enjoy. If I was going for my enjoyment of the fight scene, it would be an eight. I really, really love the Yoda fight scenes. I, I always have. Um, it, it, again, it's that point where you separate any desire for reality. It doesn't have to be real. You, you know, if it's got dragons, if it's got the Force, it doesn't matter. It has to be something. If it's got dragons, all the things you want in there. Let's go, Zola. Tony Bandelis. Yes, absolutely. If you can cut flesh, you can cut fabric. It's again, it depends on on different things like how sharp the sword is, but they are made to cut. I love how kind of control is getting. Uh, the horses were very realistic. Let's give it a one. <laughs> uh, all right, that was really nice, nice content, a uh, nice uh, video right there. Uh, yeah, I enjoyed that a lot. I know it was a reaction to a reaction, but, uh, <laughs> I enjoyed it a lot. I I'm going to look at more insider videos, hit all the buttons, guys. Hope you're all doing well. If not, keep your head up. You'll be good soon. Don't worry. Emotions are fickle, my friend. See you next time.